Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to Crossroads. Glad you guys are here in person. If you're online, man, we love you guys online, and we uh, really want to reach out to you and let you know that we care about you, and we want to hear from you. Um, so today, uh, all our resources are on ilovemychurch.org. You can click on there and get the resources for today. If you're live, of course, you can pick up the sermon notes and that kind of stuff when you come in. Uh, if you're a YouTuber, oh, I'm sorry, um, Donna McCarroll's our chat host today, okay? So if you're online, please jump in there, hit her up, tag her, talk to her, ask her silly questions, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. She loves that. She loves to hear from you guys. And then we know you're there as well. So um, if you're on YouTube, you might be doing that right now. That's cool. Um, if you do the subscribe, hit the bell and be notified of future uh, streams that we're going to have. That would be awesome as well. Uh, any any other questions you might have, go to connectatcrossroads.org, all one word. I want to remind you we have stuff for kids to do here every Sunday, but we have uh, uh, streams as well that play all week on our YouTube channel. So I don't know if you saw our little graphic that said fall back. So next week we're turning our clocks back. When I, see, when I saw that this morning, I'm like, fall down. I always have this thing, I'm going to fall off this stage. So not fall down, Jack, fall back. So if you guys would do that, that would be awesome. Remember, you don't want to show up early next week, or maybe you do, I don't know. Anyway, hey, would you guys please stand and sing with us?
going to continue to worship with a call and response prayer. I will read the speaker, and together we can read the congregation. May King Jesus, you are the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the author and finisher of our faith, who was and is to come. May you be my first thought each day and my last thought as I lay my head on the pillow. And when I can't sleep, may I recall the words of David in Psalm 63. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. Give me focus to look at everything in my world through the lens of your truth and love a love that left heaven to become a tiny, vulnerable, newborn baby. May my worship now be lived out in the name of this love. Open my spiritual eyes to see the new gifts you place before me. Surprise me with your abundance, precious Lord. What a sacrifice. Amen. Gathered at the high
beginning and no end. No tick tock of time can define. Far beyond the way our human mind can comprehend. Only by your son we recognize. No separation that we have ever known. The death, the life, the deep, the high, or wide. Hear this declaration: Our hearts are now your home. Only by your son we recognize. You can go ahead and have a seat. Yeah, clap. That was awesome. A great start to our day. If you're hey, if you're online, uh, jump in the chat room. We give a little clap for that. That was an awesome start to our day. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to be praying for our offering. And um, so God wants to know what we did with our, what we do with our time, our talents, and our treasures. So I'd like you all to just examine your heart a little bit now, and, and as the week goes on, what are you doing with your time and your talents and your treasures? Uh, to, something for you to look at. It's not something for me to do for you, but for you to look at that. So anyway, hey, if you're new here with us today, that's awesome. Glad to have you here. If you're new online, we love that as well. Um, and don't feel obligated to give. Let this service be our gift to you. But if Crossroads is your home or you want to jump in, uh, that'd be cool. Well, how would you do that? Well, first off, you can text your tithe or offering to 517 200 3972 uh, you could go to our church website, lovemychurch.org, hit the give button, that'll drop down, walk you right through it, it's pretty easy to do. And we have the black box, we gotta find a name for the black box, so if you think of a name, hit me up with that. Anyway, we have the black box over here, so you could drop that in as you leave, that would be awesome. We have a kiosk out into the vestibule, and we ask that when you use that, please sanitize your hands before you do. And if... Uh, 
If none of that's interesting to you or whatever, you don't want to try the online stuff, you could always mail your, uh, your offering to Post Office Box 946, Adrian, Michigan, 49221. And um, as a last resort, if all I've said doesn't even make any sense to you, call our church office at 266-1919, and we'd be happy to help you out with that. Would you bow your heads, please? Well, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for you, for your greatness, for your glory, and your honor. We ask you, Lord, to bless every gift, every giver, multiply it, and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. job. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, you got some, huh? You got some stuff on your nose? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you seen him? No, it's my first day. Yeah, mine too. This may be the best day of my life. <laughs> I know. He just oozes kindness, you know? If he walked in here right now, I would totally turn into a snow puddle. They say that his eyes just radiate with love and, and candy, but mostly love. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. They say that he makes you feel like you are the only person in the room. Have you ever seen how the children's faces just light up when they see him? The hope that he spreads? <laughs> I, I can't hardly contain myself right now. <laughs> you imagine being friends with him? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sometimes there aren't enough words to express how amazing he is. We should celebrate him all year round. If it were up to me, we would. His love, his grace, coming to this earth to save us. Come on, guys. Let's go celebrate Jesus' birthday. Just FYI, I was, I was talking about Jesus the whole time. Oh, I was too. Mm -hmm. I 100% I was talking about Jesus. Same page, same yeah. page. <laughs> Well, good morning, Crossroads, Crossroads Online. So glad to uh, kick off our day together this morning. Listen, I don't know about you, but that video just um, does a lot, doesn't it? I don't know if you can believe this or not, but in 55 days, we will celebrate Christmas. 55 days. And at Crossroads, we started early. We started last week in October. Here we're in week two and we're at Halloween, right? But unlike the malls and radio and media and all of those things that are trying to get us to buy early, we actually are trying to wrap this Advent conspiracy up the weekend before Black Friday because we believe that Christmas should be different. We believe that this year Christmas can be different. I mean, if you think about it, right, Christmas, the story of Christ's birth, we know that. It's a story of promise and hope. Revolutionary love is what it's about, and we get to celebrate the birth of our Savior. But instead, we live in a world and we live in a time where his birth is not even mentioned oftentimes. That instead of it being a time of celebration and worship of the King of kings and Lord of lords coming to earth, 
We're caught up in a rat race. We're doing more things than we've ever done before. We spend more. Some people, listen, are still paying for last Christmas right now. What if Christmas became a world-changing event again? What if we could be catalysts? We could be participants in such a way where Christmas could change the world. And what if God wanted to use you and me, people that know him, to do that? That's why we're doing Advent Conspiracy. So welcome to Advent Conspiracy. If you weren't here last week, you can check it out online, right? You can go and watch what you missed. I strongly encourage you to do it. Advent Conspiracy is all about reclaiming the real meaning of Christmas. It doesn't mean you throw out everything that you've been doing. It means we do it differently. We look at it differently. We make the main thing the main thing once again. So for the next four weeks, right, that's what we've been doing. We started last week, this week, two more weeks, three more weeks. We will wrap it up on the 21st of November and try to reclaim the spirit of Christmas, each one of us to do our part. So we're looking at four countercultural concepts. The Advent conspiracy is wrapped around. If you want to take out your note sheets, you can follow along. Last week, we started with number one, which was to worship fully because Christmas begins and ends with Jesus, right? So everything we do should be focused around worship of him. Number two, this is today, spend less and free up resources for things that truly matter. Next week, we're going to look at give more of your presence, not T-S, but C-E, your hands, your words, your time, your resources, and your heart. That's how we're going to reclaim it and then love all the poor, the forgotten, the marginalized, the sick, and do it in ways that truly make a difference. That's how we're going to reclaim the spirit of Christmas. Now, let me tell you what Advent Conspiracy is not. It's not just a four-week or a four-point checklist of what to do at Christmas. It's not that. It's much more than that. Advent Conspiracy is the story of a wondrous moment when God entered our world to redeem all of us. And he offers the most amazing gift you'll ever be offered. Eternal life. And when you know that and when you experience that, it changes everything. Including the way we celebrate Christmas. Now, ironically, at most Christmas parties, think about it. Jesus is why we even say Merry Christmas. Although that's become kind of overshadowed, right? Right? by the rest of the world that wants to say happy holidays. It's his birthday, yet we don't mention his name often. If you were to go around and just ask friends and neighbors and coworkers, hey, tell me, why do you get excited about Christmas? Most people won't even mention his name. They'll talk about, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to have some time off work. I can't wait to get together with family. Really? Some of us don't even like our family. <laughs> it's his birthday. And he, we can get so wrapped up in the things that we miss the main thing. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. You get that? For all people. A Savior has been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. That's Christmas. That's a reason to worship. That's a reason to celebrate. And what if Christmas could be that world-changing event again? And what if God wanted to use you and me, people that know him, that say, I have a personal relationship with him? What if he wants to use us to get it done? I believe he does. Well, what's it going to take? What's it going to take in your life? What's it going to take in my life? I want to tell you what it's going to mean. It means we're going to have to rebel. Rebel. Now, some of you say, wow, that seems pretty rough. Like, I don't even know if I'm comfortable with rebelling towards Christmas. 
some of you are like, oh, rebel. I love to rebel. Yeah, some of you are way too comfortable for all the wrong reasons. Some of you are rebels. But think about this. When you think about rebelling, what comes to mind? When I think about rebelling, what comes to mind is pushing back against maybe the norm, right? Pushing back against what society might say is right, but we know it's not right. Usually when you rebel, right, like you have, you have this cause. There's like something that you believe could be better or could be different or that they're missing the mark on and you have such a passion that you're like you know what we i can't allow this to happen that way i'm going to rebel against that because i've got this built into me so deep inside of me that it needs to go a different way if you look through history there's all kinds of people that have rebelled you read through the bible there's all kinds of stories some rebelled for the right reasons some rebelled for the wrong reasons when you think about christmas I can think all the way back to my childhood about some rebels at Christmas. I mean, some of you, if I asked you, who's a rebel? Do you know a rebel around your Christmas? You'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got a couple. Like my grandpa, he never liked Christmas, hated Christmas, wouldn't decorate for Christmas, wouldn't buy any gifts, right? We've all got one of those people in our family. You know, I'll just show you kind of where I live. I, I think about Ru Rudolph. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I look at him as a rebel, one of my favorite Christmas specials still to this day. But he was kind of a rebel, wasn't he? He was born into a great deer family. He really was. But because he was born with a red nose instead of a black nose, what did they do? He was different, so they made fun of him. His parents were embarrassed of him. They basically disowned him. And so he goes off on his own, and he meets some other misfits. He joins their posse because everybody wants to belong, right? Remember Hermie? Hermie the Elf. He's one of my favorite characters of all times. Hermie the Elf. I just want to be a dentist. <laughs> Hermie doesn't like to make toys. Hermie doesn't like to make toys. What? <laughs> I can't wait. And then he meets the abominable snowman. Remember him? They're all misfits. They don't fit. They rebel. But at the end, right? How are you going to hang that star on the tree? Oh, we got the abominable. He can do it. Rudolph, would you lead my sleigh tonight? The rebel. They needed the rebel. Here's the thing, listen, if we had time, I would go through all of these things. There's so many rebels we can point to in God's word that did great, great work. You don't have to be grumpy to be a rebel. You don't have to be a Christmas naysayer to be a rebel. I mean, man, I'm not asking you to get all scroogey. I hope you don't misinterpret this message today and be like, oh, man, he's such a doggy downer on Christmas. We're supposed to rebel against Christmas. We can't set up a tree. We can't do ornaments. I'm not saying any of that. So don't cut off too early. But that's not the message at all of Advent conspiracy. The idea of Advent conspiracy is reclaiming the real spirit of Christmas. If Christmas really is about the birth of our Savior and Lord, it doesn't get any better than that. If Christmas, knowing Christ and receiving the gift that he offers all of us of eternal life, listen, there's not a better gift for your family to experience than that, for your loved ones to experience than that. It doesn't get any better than that. We live in a world that this just, I get it, but I don't get it. It's like, oh, if, if, we, if they don't get a bunch of gifts under their tree, they're going to miss Christmas. No, if you miss the gift of Christmas, you miss Jesus, you miss Christmas, you miss life, you miss the purpose of life, you miss the reason that you were created. What if we got serious about that, reclaiming that? What if instead of being bystanders, and getting so caught up in all the commercialization of Christmas, what if we decided that I want to be a part of reclaiming the greatest event 
God coming to this world to rescue us. I want to be that kind of a rebel. How are we going to do this? How, what are we going to rebel against? Take out your note sheets if you haven't already. If you're filling in the blanks, here's the number one. Spend less. Spend less. I would say there's one thing that the followers of Jesus can rebel against this Christmas. We can rebel against this idea of hyper-consumerism, of overspending on things that really don't matter. I mean, can really, does anybody need more gizmos and gadgets to stick in a drawer or to shove in a closet that won't even close already? I mean, really, do we need that? But if you listen to the message that the world sends, every, it's already started on TV. There's already Christmas commercials. There's already a drive to tell you you better buy early because you might miss Christmas. You might not even be able to get the stuff that you want. And so everybody wants the dollar, and they want you to spend them fast. Now they're saying pre-Black Friday. It keeps getting earlier and earlier and earlier, this push. And if you have kids, right? Like I used to sit around and go through the J.C. Penney and Sears catalog. Remember you used to get those in the mail? The Christmas catalogs. Everything was Christmas. And I'd have doggy earmarks on all kinds of pages. And I'd circle and I'd hint. And I'd show my mom and I'd show my dad. And I'd do it over and over and over and over again. I know you're going to find this hard to believe. But I bet they found it irritating. That I could be irritating. <laughs> annoying. We still live in that world. And even though many of us are adults, right, we still can kind of act that way. And let's face it, we live in an empire of overspending. We live in the kingdom of more. I'm never satisfied. I need more and more and more and more and more. And I'm suggesting that maybe, just maybe, we could do it different this year. Think of it this way. Fill this in. Christmas in America is more about getting what we want than giving people what they need. Would you agree with that? Christmas in our country is more about giving people what they want. What do you want for Christmas? I want this and this and this. We make want lists. Nothing wrong with that. But can we just agree that in America it's more about wants than it is needs? Because when I think of a need... <laughs> What we really need, what our needs really are, is food, clothing, and shelter. That's the three biggies, right? Like, I don't really need a new phone, a new cell phone. I know they come out with a new model every year. But I don't need a new phone. I have one that works. But I want one, right? I don't need a new refrigerator, our refrigerator is like 20-something years old, probably close to 30 years old, but it still works. No, no, I, we can't get any ice out of the front door. I can't get any water out of the front door. It doesn't have LED lights. Still has an ice maker. Still has a freezer. But when I go to the store and I see the ones on display, I'm like, honey, did you see that? like you can tap the door and the light comes on on the inside and it's got a clear window you can see in. Some have TVs on them. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> we live in America. We will replace those things even when they're not broken because I need that. No, you want that. That's not a need. That's a want. And trust me, I'm an expert at telling people what I need. I tell my wife, honey, I need this. I need this new tool. What are you going to do with it? I don't know, but it looks really, really cool, and I'll find a use for it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Can we just agree that in America, Christmas for most of us is more about wants than it is needs? Isaiah chapter 55 it's not on your note sheets, but just listen to this verse. Why do you spend your wages on that which does not satisfy? Isn't that a profound question? 
because we think it will satisfy, because the media and the way they advertise stuff tells me if I have that, I will feel better about myself. If we lived there, if I drove that, if I wore that, if I smelled like that, if my hair looked like that, and we buy those things because we buy the lies, and we get it. It's like, why, why would you... Why would you spend your wages on stuff that doesn't satisfy? Like, how many times have you done that? <laughs> I always tell people, I'm not that good, but I'm slow. And sometimes I'm a slow learner. Like, how many times have I bought something on an impulse, thinking it would do something for me, that the last 700 times I did it, it didn't? But maybe this time it will. You know that's insanity, right? Trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results? That's insanity. I've done that. Maybe you've done that. Okay, so get this. Spending less does not mean spending nothing. We're talking about spending less, but spending less doesn't mean that you're not going to spend anything. What if we rebelled a little bit and we just said, wow, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, it's not like, hey, sorry, kids, nothing this year. Nothing. We're just going to sing. Yes, we're going to eat, but no gifts. Thank Pastor Scott for that. No, no, that, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> I can see the hate mail rolling in now. <laughs> we're not saying don't spend anything. Advent conspiracy is about what if, what if we took part of our money Advent conspiracy, if you buy all the way in, it's 50%. It'd say, if you planned on spending, by the way, you know what the average family will spend this year? This is on average, which means some will spend less, some will spend quite a bit more. The average, they say, is $997.79. That's how much you'll spend on Christmas gifts on average, almost $1,000. What if we redirected half of that? We're already going to spend it. But what if we just said, we're going to cut that number in half and give half of it towards meeting some needs... Food, clothing, shelter for people in our own community and across the world that would really meet a need. That's what Advent conspiracy is about, but it doesn't mean that you're not spending anything. For some of you, listen, just for a practical reason, most of us would be better off spending less. Some people spend every year with money that they don't have. That doesn't make sense anytime. You say, how do you know if I'm spending money that I don't have? It's called a credit card with a balance on it. That's an indicator we're spending more, right? And again, like I said, some people are still spending for last Christmas. If the truth were known, some of you are probably like five or six years behind. But you got that dang thing on sale. Yeah, 26% interest, you're doing really good. Listen, I'm not talking down at you. I'm just talking real. And I've been there. You know how much money they say the American, uh, just Americans, how much we'll spend on Christmas this year for gifts, for wants? $475 billion. $475 billion. Do you realize that's 45 times the amount of money it would take to drill fresh water wells in every place in the world where kids and adults are dying from parasites getting into their bodies from poor drinking water? We could do that 45 times over in one Christmas. Think that might make Jesus smile? Think that might make some little kids smile? Can you imagine? My kids have never had to drink polluted water, but they were so thirsty, that's all they had. Never has happened. But we live in a world where it happens over and over and over and over and over. What if we redirected some of our Christmas spending towards meeting real needs and not just wants? That's what Advent conspiracy is about. That's what Advent conspiracy is about. Number two, how do we become a Christmas rebel? Spend less. And number two, spend less except when I should spend more. <laughs> Say what? Doesn't that sound like a politician? Yeah, you should spend less except when you should spend more. Yeah, that sounds really good. What does it mean? Well, keep in mind it's his birthday anyway, right? If we keep Christ as the centerpiece, as our focal point, if we realize, listen, it's really about him, it, doesn't it make more sense to spend less except when you could spend more to meet greater needs? Doesn't it? I don't need more stuff. 
I really don't. But to meet needs, real needs, to use some of the money that I was going to spend for trinkets and things that just because we're getting together and I don't know what else to get, so I just picked this thing up. If that same few dollars could provide some meals for some kids that are literally malnourished, wouldn't that make more sense? I mean, if I just walk around my house with this attitude, and my guess is maybe walk around your house, and kind of a lot of us are collectors, right? Whatever your thing is. I mean, if you really think about this, I've seen people, and listen, I'm not looking through your windows. People always say, have you been to my house? Or you have cameras? I do, but not at your house. But this is just us, so don't think this is pointed directly at you unless it is for you. But I've seen people, like, they've got 2,000 salt and pepper shakers that they've collected from all over. I mean, pick the thing, right? I'm not bagging on salt and pepper shakers. But when you look at it with this lens of meeting needs versus wants and buying stuff that because I got the money and I just, you know, I like these things and I've got storage shelves full of these things, whatever these things are, the stuff that we really don't need. And to think about the dollar amounts that have been spent and to think what those same dollars could do, meeting a real need, it doesn't make me so excited to walk around my house. When I went to Honduras for the first time, years ago with a group from Crossroads, and I smelled for the first time what real poverty is. When I saw little bitty kids that looked like they were three and four and found out they were seven or eight, and you could just count every rib on their body. And that bright glow that my grandkids have, that theirs was very dull, and that their hair that should have been jet black was kind of a faded brown because of malnourishment. And they had to be held because they weren't strong enough to walk. And when you saw their home, which... Most of us, we wouldn't put a dog in it. It's basically a makeshift shed from debris they find other places. And you go into what I would store a lawnmower in, and you find there's a family of eight living in that with little rope hammocks for the adults and kids sleeping on dirt floor. Their skin, instead of being dark, dark brown, starts to get faded patches from the moisture of them laying on the ground every night. I remember laying in my room and saying, God, don't you see this? God, don't you have a plan for these kids? And it was like God spoke to my heart in a way I didn't miss. And he said, yeah, Scott, I see it and I have a plan. You're the plan. People that know me are the plan. My church is the plan. Advent conspiracy. We can make that kind of a difference. Can we do it for everyone? No, but you can do it for one or two or three. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 13 and 14. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later they'll have plenty and you can share with and, and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. That's why we need to rebel. That's why I love Advent conspiracy. That's why I would love you to entertain and me to entertain spending less except when we could spend more to meet more needs, to be his hands, to be his feet. It's hard to tell people that Jesus loves them when their kids are dying in front of their face because of poor quality of water or not having enough money for food. And we could do something about it. 
I believe Christmas can still change the world. It can still change the world. Fill this in if you're taking notes. A real challenge for some serious Christmas rebels is give more than I can spare. C.S. Lewis was a very gifted writer and talented author, right? He was also a committed follower of Christ. You may have read some of his work. Let me read to you what C.S. Lewis said. I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts and luxuries and amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. If our charities as followers do not at all pinch or hamper us, I would say they're too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures exclude them. In other words, he's saying, wouldn't it be if, if we were willing to sacrifice some of the stuff we want to give people with need that we gave more than we could spare? It's not just our leftovers. It's actually to make giving to needs a priority. Because God has blessed us with so much, we have to share it. Because there's people in great need. Matthew 25, 40 says, Whatever you did, whenever you did to one of the least of these, to the overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it for me. When we give to that kind of a need, Jesus says, It's like you're giving to me. I'm that little kid that's malnourished. I'm the one that can't have good quality drinking water. I'm the little kid sleeping on the dirt. How are we going to rebel this Christmas? Well, I think there's a bunch of ways. First, it's going to take some intentionality, right? It's going to take a conversation in your home as a family even. I don't know how exactly you're going to do it, but you can figure it out if it's a priority. And it'll mean each of you will have some conversations, and I think they're good conversations. Here's a question to ask. Are we willing to rethink the way we use our wealth? Are we willing to rethink how we use our wealth? Are we just willing to do that? Remember I shared earlier that we spend, four, we're spend they said $450 billion on Christmas this year. 45 times the amount of money to drill a fresh water well in every place in the world that doesn't have clear drinking water. Can you imagine? I've seen pictures. I've seen the video when a well comes and it gets drilled because some people redirected some money in a village, an entire village, all of a sudden that you would think it was the greatest thing in the world and they're excited because clear drinking water is coming out where they have access to it. That's life-changing. We can be a part of that. How would our community and world change if we all had those conversations, if we decided we were going to go redirect 50% of our Christmas spending or 40% or whatever, just have the conversation and do something? Look at what 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you, we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. God says, listen, that's how it's going to happen. People are going to scratch their head and say, what kind of people would, do a, would cut back on what they could do for themselves to do for people like us that maybe they've never met? And God says, I'm going to use that in such a way where they're going to thank me because that's the only way it makes sense. The people that would give that kind of a gift are the ones that have received the greatest gift ever. And so how could we withhold it? So what's our Advent conspiracy plan? Well, it's to love all, including the poor, the sick, the forgotten in our community and beyond. Specifically at Crossroads, we're going to help our strategic mission partners that we have in our own backyard right here at Crossroads that we partner with every year. And then we're going to also you, you share it with our partners in Romania and Honduras, those little kids, babies that are basically left by the side of the road. Crossroads supports that. That's what we're going to do. So on the 21st of November, 
Right before Black Friday, we're going to have our Advent conspiracy offering. That's above our regular tithes and offering. This isn't our tithe. This is specifically what we said we we're going to spend on Christmas. We're redirecting part of it. And we'll bring it. That is a separate thing on the 21st of November. And whatever is collected is going to be shared in our community here and with our partners in Romania and Honduras to meet real needs. Real needs. So what's our goal? Listen, we've had goals when the church was small as much as, as little as five or 10,000. The biggest goal we set was 100,000, and we, we shot over it. We didn't set a monetary goal this year. Why? Because we just want you to say yes. We want you to engage with this material and say yes. Whatever yes looks like in your family, have these conversations. And when we bring it all together on the 21st, whatever it is, it'll be split and divided with those partners, both in our backyard and all across this world in Romania and Honduras. That's what it's about. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. But let's be honest, it does something inside of us, right? It just does. It rubs us. But doesn't it just seem right? Doesn't it just make sense? You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And we take our gifts to those in need they will thank God. Imagine if this Christmas was different than before. Imagine if Christmas became a world-changing event again. And I believe it can happen one family, one individual at a time that just takes all this in and says, yes, how could it make sense any other way? To celebrate the greatest event, God coming to earth as a human being on a mission to rescue all of us from sin. How has it gotten so pushed back, overshadowed, covered up? How do we get off base so far? Where in many homes, his name is not even mentioned. Let's make Christmas life-changing, world-changing again. Let's do that. Let's meet real needs instead of focusing on wants because Christmas still begins and ends with Jesus. And when you have him, you have everything. But without him, you really don't have anything. Would you bow your heads with me? Heads bowed and eyes closed. God, I just want to thank you for you. <laughs> Here we are on Halloween talking about Christmas. But quite honestly, God, every day should be Christmas. Because there's nothing more important in this world than you and what you've done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. And so, God, here we are 55 days away from that world-changing event. God, I pray for everyone that is here, everyone watching, that knows you, God, that it would be reflected this year in a different way, that we would rebel for a great reason, because it's just right. It's the spirit of Christmas. You sacrificed your own son because Christmas was the beginning but we also know how it ended and you were willing to do that for us God may we reclaim that spirit where Christmas can be a world changing event again and may it start in my home in each one of our homes that know you 
with her head still bowed and her eyes closed, listen, some of you that may be in this room or listening, watching this online, it's, you can't export what you haven't imported. <laughs> Can I ask you, have you received the greatest gift you've ever been offered? Have you received Jesus as your own Savior and Lord? I'm not saying do you believe in God. I'm asking you, have you trusted him through his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you with your own lips confessed that you're a sinner? If not, today's your day right where you're at. You can open the greatest Christmas gift you'll ever open today. His name is Jesus. He wants to be your Savior and Lord. He died so that you could live. He came on Christmas to grow up as a human, to go through everything we go through but to do it perfectly. And for that, they crucified him on a cross. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. And three days later on Easter, he rose from the dead and defeated death so that everyone who would trust in him and anyone that would put their faith in him, he would give them credit for his perfection because he's already paid for your imperfections. And he'll give you the gift of eternal life. If you've never done that, today can be your Christmas day. Just say, Jesus, I don't understand it all, but I know I'm a sinner. And so today I acknowledge that. I turn from my sin and I turn to you as my only hope, my greatest hope. And I give you my life. Thanks for giving yours for me. Adopt me into your family. Come into my heart. From this day forward, I want to live for you, follow you, point people towards you, use my time and my talent and my treasure to make your name famous and so that other people will experience you like I am. And I say thanks for the greatest gift ever. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said and everybody typed in chat, amen. Let me direct your attention to the bottom of your note sheets. There's a little bit of homework there, right? We want to encourage you to meet as a small group. Want to encourage you to meet with your family, maybe another friend or family from here at church, and go through this stuff, dialogue about it, engage in it. Those of you that are in this room, you also got a small group guide so you can have those discussions, talk about it, further dialogue. If you're at home, you can go on our website, click on the front page where it says message notes and resources, and you can download your own copy of the small group guide there. I would encourage you to do that. Begin to pray and enter his story. Ask God to speak to your heart about these things. He will. Trust me, he will. And um, begin to have those conversations about how you as a family how you're going to engage with this Advent conspiracy and let's reclaim the real spirit of Christmas. And then the next three weeks, make them a priority. Next week, we're going to talk about give more. Spend less today, give more. It's probably not exactly how you think. This can really change your Christmas in a great way. Um, so you don't want to miss that. Again, just your reminder, it's not as big a deal. It doesn't seem like in the fall, but it messes with everybody when we do these time change. It never really bothers me. Um, you fall back, you get an extra hour of sleep. You should be more perky next week than you've ever been because you're going to have more sleep. Bring someone with you or point someone to online if they're not yet comfortable being out and about in a group of people. Trunk or treat is tonight in our parking lot, 5 o'clock to 7. It's going to be great. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors especially the ones with kids. It's all free. There's lots of candy. Thank you so much for those of you that brought in candy weeks ago. Thank you for those of you that have brought it today. Thank you for those of you that have said you'll share your trunk and you're going to sit out in the parking lot tonight and have a lot of smiles on your face when we see these little kids come through because it's going to be a great night for them. And the weather, you can hardly beat it. It's going to be 59 today, a little warm for me, but it could be... 70, right? So thank God for that. So yeah. So anyway, stay tuned for that. Hope you have a great, great afternoon. Hope to see many of you back with family and friends and neighbors tonight at five o'clock. And uh, let's do this thing. Let's do it one life at a time. Go after some needs. 
because the wants just don't do it. God bless. Have a great day. Thank you.